This is Hear It From The Pen. This is the podcast where we talk to insurance professionals and other professionals who have uh, decided to write a book. Very scary. Today, we're going to do this book. So she did. And I have the author here, Skylar Romine. Skylar, welcome. Thank you, Nick. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. So you wrote a book. Was this the, this the first book you've ever written? This was the first book. Yeah. And for a long time during the process, I swore it would be the last. So <laughs> that means there might be a sequel. There's might be something coming. We'll see. Okay. This is the, the first swing at this. What made you decide? Was it insanity? Drugs? What made you decide to actually go through it? Because it's it's not easy. Yeah, no drugs. I think insanity is part of all of my decision making processes, right? Maybe a few people can relate to that. You know, I started out, actually, it's funny. It was during, you know, kind of the height of the pandemic when everybody was home a lot. And I was looking for projects to kind of fill my time outside of work and home life. And you had these extra hours where you couldn't go anywhere and do the things you would normally do. And so one thing that had kept coming up repetitively in different conversations was I kept hearing the insurance industry is 70% female. And that statistic really bothered me because it didn't ring true with my experience in the insurance industry, but it didn't bother me enough for a while that I did anything about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I started really looking around at not only the insurance industry, but also the industries that I've always serviced in my role, which are, you know, construction development and commercial real estate. And I started realizing, you know, oh, All of these industries are extremely predominantly male, which, you know, after a decade and a half doing my function, I had never really realized. And I think part of that is I grew up just as a massive tomboy, was a skateboarder, always spent a lot of time around boys and never really thought about like, hey, I have more boy guy friends than girlfriends or I'm working with more men than women. To Mm -hmm. me, it was just kind of like I'm working with competent people and that's what matters. Right. But when I really started thinking about that statistic, 70 percent of the insurance industry as female, I started really looking around and thought this absolutely can't be true. So I started digging into it a little bit more. And what I realized was it is true that about 70% of the commercial insurance industry is female, but most of those people are in service roles, lower paying, you know, account assistant, account manager, mm-hmm. some on executive roles. They're not in production roles or underwriting roles or claims roles where they have an opportunity. Not enough. To build a career. Not enough, yeah. right. No, We're yeah. seeing it more yeah. and more, right? Yeah. So I got licensed as a broker in 2007 or 2008. And I will say even just through my lifetime as a broker, which is, you know, a little under two decades now, it, the landscape has changed tremendously for the better for women, right? So there is definitely progress. And I think that's something so important is like, as we look to always move forward, we should also appreciate how far we've come. And there is a big change that's happened for, you know, for positive for women, which is awesome. But So I started digging into it, you know, just being kind of the nerd that I am, started taking notes for my own education, had no, the thought of writing a book had never crossed my mind at this point, right? I I just wanted to dig into more, you know, because the stats that I was reading weren't true to my experience. And so I wanted to understand them better. And I had more free time on my hands than ever before because of the pandemic and being home. So I thought, you know, I'm going to start taking some notes and started digging into these industries that I work with construction, you know, where they say any anywhere from 11 to, you know, you hear 16 to 17% of the industry is female now, which is extremely low, you know, commercial real estate's not dissimilar, right? Most, most of the folks in that industry are male, especially in positions of ownership and equity. And so that's what I really started digging into is how do we get more women in these roles where they really have opportunities to A, make a lot of money, B, really grow their careers and kind of have a fulfilling career and have, you know, an opportunity to to do the things they want, not just be servicing someone else's accounts to to perpetuity, right? Um, And then at some point I kind of had this, you know, point of deciding which way to go on the path where I was like, I either need to do something. Now I'm spending too much time looking into this and I have all these notes. I probably have, you know, 30 pages of data at this point, you know, do I either write a book and do something with it or do I stop doing this and dedicate my time to something more valuable? And what I decided was, hey, if I can get enough women to interview with me, because I want to include, you know, just statistics Mm -hmm. on boring, I want to include some real life stories. I think that would resonate a lot better with people. So I kind of had this point where I said, okay, I'm going to reach out to some of my networks. I'm going to reach out to Crew, which is Commercial Real Estate Women of OC. I'm going to reach out to NAWIC, you know, North American Association of Women in Construction. I'm going to reach out to some of my clients and some of my friends and say, hey, you know, 
do you know women in XYZ position who'd like to share stories about ABC? And if you do know anyone who fits into my way, and I thought, okay, I need, you know, at least a couple dozen women to make this work. And if I don't have it in two weeks, I'm stopping. I'm never touching this again. That was kind of the deal I made myself. Mm -hmm. Like you need to make this a valuable proposition or walk away. And within a couple of days, I had 36 women who had either emailed or called me. And so I thought, okay, this isn't just me. There are clearly women out there who want to share their story. And the actual number, I think, ended up being closer to 100, which, you know, unfortunately, not everybody got to be included in the book. But I did interview well over 50 women before kind of cutting it down. So um, that's really how the book was born. And then, you know, the process of writing it was a nightmare, frankly, because I didn't know what I was doing. And I had written about three fourths of a book before I started doing the interviews, which for anyone who's considering writing a book where you're going to include yeah. other people's stories, you want to do it the other way, right? Because then once I did the interviews, I basically had to rewrite the whole book. I just trashed that whole first draft. Which That's I not thought- unusual. I, I think for a lot of writers that would be watching this because because we you know we we've published um, female authors as well and, and I think in the editing process like sometimes you feel as though you're writing the book two or three times yeah yeah that's really what I went through where I thought you know I had this draft of a book that I was pretty proud of and then I had all these women share their experiences with me, which were so interesting and unique and diverse, right? And once I had heard all of their stories, I looked back at what I had written and it was like only my perspective to the point of being almost dishonest, right? Where I felt like I had learned so much more through my conversations with them that to put that book out into the world would be doing everyone a disservice. And I really had to just rework the whole thing around their stories as opposed to, you know, and making the statistics and my own thoughts secondary to the stories that these successful women were willing to share. Yeah. So you had mentioned the progress we've made specifically in insurance I think it's probably helpful to give a little bit of your background because you've already snuck a little bit of that in around when you got your brokerage. Like you're a producer, you've been in brokerage, which has been very much a boys club, right? And and what you've been and and how it's been operating for like hundreds of years, right? So sure. the concept of women producers is fairly new in the history of insurance. Can you talk about like first what got you in? Right. But this timeline, because I feel like the last decade or two, there's been drastic progress. I think digitization has caused some of that. But what have you seen specifically? What brought you in and how have you seen the arc change to the present? Yeah. So what brought me into insurance initially was I had a family member who, you know, was pretty high up with a premium financing firm. And I was working at Nordstrom, doing sales there, going to college, you know, putting myself through school and complaining about the hours and how they were always irregular. And gosh, I wish I could just work, you know, normal hours during the day. And she said, well, why don't you go talk to a couple of the brokers that I work with and see if anyone needs some help around the office. And I thought like most kids getting into insurance, I'll just do this till I graduate. You know, it's a good job. I'll do it till I graduate. Hmm. Never going to make a career out of it. Don't want to do this long term. Um, Of course, by the time I graduated, that had changed pretty dramatically. And here we are almost 20 years later, you know, having this conversation. But that was really how I got into insurance and, you know, started on the retail brokerage side, other than a few years where I worked exclusively with a captive group based out of Texas. I've always been on the retail brokerage side. I felt pretty lucky that I started out in that space to begin with, which was kind of intentional. I had had some feedback from several folks who said this is a good place to be in in the industry. And I think it was a good fit for me. Yeah. Did, did you start in personal lines or did you did you immediately go into commercial lines? Immediately went into commercial lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, so you did the, it. You did it the hard way. I got thrown into the deep end of the pool. Yeah. Which I think works really well for my personality. I will say as well, you know, my first insurance job, I had a mentor there who we talk about mentorship in the book. Right. And how important yep. it is it is. And I didn't realize at the time how important that was. And I'll go ahead and say her name was Joan. She's not working any longer, but she was, gosh, she had to be in her late sixties or early seventies when I was working under her and without Joan and and everybody said, cause I talked to a few different brokerages. Everybody said, you don't want to work for Joan. Joan's a hard ass. I don't know if I can say that word here, but Joan's tough to work for. Okay. She's a difficult woman. That's not how you want to start your career. And I've always been like hyper motivated, you know, really high energy person wants to learn a lot, wants to learn quickly. And I thought 
I think Joan's exactly who I want to work for. Right. And so, but she did, you know, with love would throw you into the deep end of the pool with no floaties and just let you sink or swim on your own. But for me and for people who operate the way that I do, being put into that type of environment is good for you. You know, it helps you thrive. So I think Joan kind of instinctively knew that I could handle her brand of tough love. And so it worked really well for both of us. Right. And she made a huge difference. I mean, I don't think she probably realizes, I've tried telling her before, but over the course of my career, how much having Joan in the beginning really impacted mm -hmm. my ability to do everything that I did from that point on. So. And it's, it's important. So as, as a guy, I don't, I don't, necessarily i can empathize but i don't know if i can sympathize with specifically with what you or other females have gone through what i hear is that a lot of times it's females that can be the hard ones it's females that can be cause um uh, can prevent other females from sort of advancing and that there have been a lot of male allies. You talk in the book about allies. You talk in the book about mentorship. You just brought that up. Um, can you go in, can you go a little bit more into the mentorship part of it, the ally element of it? Because if we're not pulling for each other through this thing, then it, you know, how, how can young females specifically who we who we both agree, we would like to come in. We think there's a nice home for them here in insurance. How can we get more in if we don't have more mentors or allies to help them figure out what their roadmap needs to be, what the, you know, where, where they need to put the ladder on and how they need to climb that ladder. What can be done in that area for both men and women to encourage younger women to come in, but give them a path, give, give, you know, give them a shot. Sure. So a lot to unpack there, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I will say for me personally, you know, I never ran into, well, I can't say never. It was rare to have the experience of another woman who was clearly and intentionally standing in my path. Although I will say this is something I've heard from quite a few people. And I think the feedback that I've gotten, you know, and I'll share this again, not having a lot of firsthand experience with it, but I have had several conversations with people who have had similar experiences is you know, there was a certain generation of women where women were really kind of just entering the workforce and especially in our industry. And if you were going to have one successful woman in the office or in the company, she was the only one. You weren't going to have two or yeah. three, right? And so I do think there are women of a certain generation, some of them, not all of them, who that mentality was kind of burned into them where it was like, hey, if one woman's going to succeed, it's going to be me. And so they had to, for their own benefit, mm -hmm. they were building their own career, adopt that mentality. And once you have something like that built into you, it can be hard to shake, right? I do think in terms of, you know, women blocking out other women from roles and things like that, my vantage point, what I've seen firsthand is it's getting so much better. I think our generation, the generation, you know, coming up behind us is so much more, they realize that you know, the pie is so big and everybody can have a piece of the pie. And so it doesn't, we don't run into that as often, I don't think, or mm -hmm. I don't at least, which is good. Right. But male allies are another critical thing. And I mean, in terms yeah. of mentorship for me, I would say, unless, you know, for some reason you're just much more comfortable with one gender or another. And if that's the case, I would say, do what you can to work towards getting over that. Cause you're going to have to work with both during your career. Right. Yeah. But in terms of a mentor, I think a lot of it is luck and timing and who is willing to put the effort into you. And it's less important whether they're male or female. It's more important that they have your best interest at heart and they want to help you do what's best. Right. Yep. So I wouldn't make the mentor's gender like number one or even top five or top 10 on my list of things to look for in a great mentor. Um, it, it's something that our industry, I think, lacks is we have a lot of folks who are nearing retirement, who have had a great career. Yeah continue to make good money. And then we have, you know, I am seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. At least I'm optimistic on the other end where I'm seeing more colleges now have insurance and risk management majors and people are actually going to those classes and mm. choose that as a career, which in the past, you never heard of anyone choosing insurance. Yeah. Just how did you fall into it? Right. How long have you been here? How much time? Like us, you, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally. I never mm. expected to do it. Um, so I think there's, you know, a younger generation coming in that we'll have. We need more. There's definitely a talent gap in the industry. 
but we've got kind of this massive gap between these new grads and these close to retirees with not a lot of talent who has a lot of experience in between. And so I, you know, I think anytime you can find someone who's on that end of folks who's about to, you know, retire out and they're willing to help and take you under their wing and, you know, make your career important to them, take that help, <laughs> right? T doesn't matter if they're male or female, let them help and guide you. And, 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 I, and I think there's an important message there as well for not just the mentors, but, you know, just executives in general. Like, you cannot allow this wisdom to just walk out of your office. You cannot allow people to just retire. And, and, I, and, and I'm finding, Skylar, over the past few months, because I actually have um, some clients in this space in knowledge management, that, you know, like a, like a, a skilled underwriter, for instance, um, there's something innate, like over time, like you have almost, you know, now 20 years, right? There's something innate. I can look at a submission and within a very short period of time, I can make a judgment on that. And that can only be honed over time. Your expertise is probably a lot of things that you have a, a skill set. It's almost innate now, right? In what you can do and the things that you can turn around, you probably aren't even aware that it's a skill. Right. It's probably just like, oh, yeah, everybody can do this, but they can't. Right. And you can do it like quick. Um, and I think that's a that's a key message for executives as well in what in what they can do, because there is that gap in between. So there are there are those people that like are leaving and the people who are coming in and you have a big gap in the middle. And it's like you can't you can't have the newbies coming in and, and learning everything, every detail from scratch. Like there right. has to be some wisdom that gets passed along. And I think, I think that's, that's an important element of what you're discussing. Yeah. And I think it's a huge opportunity for agencies and brokerage to set themselves apart in the coming years, right? Is like, what is your training and mentorship program look like both on the service side and the sales side? Because people are coming in learning two different skill sets, but they also need just industry knowledge. And to your point, I mean, there are also a lot of factors as a broker or whatever role you're going into, right? Things like networking, like, you know, building your network, knowing who to reach out to for this function or that function, both internally and externally, right? Within your own yeah. company, within your partners, within your clients, and learning all of those things and kind of the, the tricks of the trade, if you will. I mean, yes, people can probably fumble through it on their own through however many years, but having someone to kind of guide you through that process and make those introductions and all of those things just makes the the job so much easier. And I wonder, you know, if someone's left on their own to fumble through, what's the retention rate look like there versus if they, you know, because are they really going to put the five or six or seven or 10 years into it that it takes to really build your network and become really proficient in a exactly. role? Exactly. I, I think I think that's the critical message is insurance is not even even with the risk management majors, colleges are now, you know, I think increasing the amount of volume in the studies that make it available, you're still going to have folks like us who kind of fall into it. And in and, and Skylar, that's been my passion around doing podcasts and blogging and, and educating people around insurance is that this is a lot more interesting than people think it is. The stereotypes don't always fit. There is a home for these folks. And I got fortunate. I spent my first 10 years, I was in brokerage as well. I spent my first 10 years not enjoying it. I spent okay. my first 10 years looking to get out. I always thought I'd get over into finance. And then I stumbled up upon the catastrophe area and I found my home. And I yeah. said to myself, it should not have taken me 10 years. And a lot of that was working at major brokerages and asking questions about captives, asking questions about reinsurance, these things that looked cool and interesting, but there was no path for me. Like no one wanted me to get out of my little cubby, you know, my cubicle that I was in. It's like, no, you're stuck in commercial insurance. And it's like, but I wasn't happy there. It's not exactly what I wanted to do. It didn't fit my skill set. So I think what you just described, is critically important. And I think it shouldn't take 10 years. It should take five or less for someone to find the specific home, whatever it is. It could be surety. You know, it doesn't matter. Whatever your home is, like they should be able to find it quick, faster. 
And it can be a few things, right? I mean, I think that's one, a lot of people sleep on the insurance industry as a career yeah. for opportunities. And I get it. Look, I remember being 18 or 19 when I got licensed and thinking insurance is not a sexy career, mm -hmm. right? A, I don't think a lot of people realize how much money you can make in insurance, right? And they go into, you know, like commercial real estate brokerage or other sales roles where they think, or tech, you know, tech sales where they think, you know, these are hot industries now and you can make a lot of money. You can make a lot of money as an insurance producer too. People just don't think about it as often. And a lot of it's recurring revenue, which you don't necessarily get in other industries, right? So people definitely shouldn't sleep on that. But also, you know, you could be a retail broker for 10 years and decide you don't like it and you want to go to wholesale or you want to, you know, maybe like you said, you wanted to go into accounting, maybe you're more math focused and, and you go into actuarial or you go into yeah. reinsurance, you know, maybe you just like things to be more, you know, structured and simple and not have as much variation. You go into personal auto. I mean, the insurance industry is so many different things, right? It's not just one thing. And I think if people are unhappy to your point, you know, three to five years in, Maybe it's the company, maybe it's the role, you know, talk to the people ahead of you and, and let them know that maybe it's not a good fit. I think, you know, how your company responds to that kind of conversation will say a lot about whether you're, you know, working for a good company or not. But hey, I think everybody has a role that they can find that they'll fit into within the insurance yeah. industry if they want to and if they stick with it and are committed to um, and the right kinds of leaders are going to help you do that to get you in the right place where you feel fulfilled and can also provide value and make a difference. I mean, I, I found that the the best underwriters were usually engineers or economists. They had, you know, they 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 had quantification skills. They they were good with numbers, right? But but they could apply it as well. I'm sure you see the same thing. I'm sure the the best producers have a particular skill set. Right. Not everyone can be a good producer. Produ production is incredibly difficult. That's why they get compensated so well. Right. And so it's, I think it's critically important for those people to find their specific niche. I knew early on that I could not be like a true producer. So if I was going to be on brokerage, I had to be on the other side. So I had to be market facing and not client facing. It wasn't my skill sets. Right. Sure. You, you strike me as someone who is very much client oriented, very good with the client. You can influence what they, what they, can do what they should do. They'll listen to you. Um, and and I, I think I think that's very important. What I loved about the book is that you you did break it out into pieces. Like someone can pick up this book and jump into any sort of chapter and just start right there. You don't have to go beginning to end that there's there's like you you have right away. So you have what I love like you Besides, after the introduction, you have embracing uniqueness. And I think that's very much a Skylar thing, right? But you have networking, mentors, navigating politics, resilience, fin financial literacy, personal branding. Like these are all critical things, but they, it does not have to go linearly through those things. And you gave examples one by one. Um, I'm specific for you specifically, because you, you do interview quite a few women in this book. For you, when I think of you, and I think of what really a lot of the noise that you've made for yourself, it does go around embracing uniqueness and personal branding. Can you go into that a little bit? Because I, in this day and age, I think it's just critically important if you're going to be successful, you have to brand yourself. So there has to be uniqueness about yourself um, and, and you have to stick your neck out a little bit. And that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. I don't know if it was uncomfortable for you, seemed natural for you, but can you talk a little bit about your, what your element of this, you know, which sure. is, I think the personal branding and being unique. Sure. I appreciate that. First of all, funny that you say that I'll give another little hint. If I were going to venture into writing another book, it would probably be more geared towards personal branding, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's something that is critically important today in any type of role and will only continue to be more and more that way. And I think with the next generation, I won't put myself even into that generation. I think I'm probably one generation above, right? They've grown up on the internet and on social media and personal branding is kind of an innate thing to them more so than it, it was for us or, or the folks in front of us. But I think as that 
trend continues because I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon, right? I think there's so much opportunity, especially in an industry like insurance that has been slower to adopt things like social media and personal branding and how important mm-hmm. it is to put yourself out there for the people who are willing to and able to, you know, A, kind of show who you really are, which it, it, it is unnatural and it is uncomfortable, right? And for a lot of years, I mean, I've spoken about this publicly on social media, you know, I'm a recovering people pleaser where for all of my best intentions, you know, because mm-hmm. I think my innate desires. And to your point earlier about producers, I think there are different kinds of producers, the kind of producer I am. I just want to take care of everybody. I don't love insurance. I'm not super passionate about insurance. I know a lot about insurance. I'm good at it. But what I really love is taking care of people and their businesses and helping them grow and seeing them thrive. That's where it all comes from for me. And But the dark side of that is you can really easily want to make people happy too bad to where you lose yourself, right? And so that was a journey for me when I was younger. And I think what I ultimately came to was just be who you are and you're going to naturally attract the people that should be around you, the people you should work with, the people you should be friends with um, and repel those who, you know, nothing wrong, but maybe they're just different kinds of folks and you can still get along, but they don't need to be the people you work closest with. And I think that's so important rather than trying to be everything for everyone finding a place. I wish I had done it younger, right? If, especially mm-hmm. if you can, when you're young, find a place where you just are who you are and you naturally kind of find your crew. You're going to build a career that's so much more successful and just a life that's so much happier, right? Yeah. And the personal branding goes along with that personal branding, whether it's social media or whatever kind of marketing channels you want to use, you know, when people feel like they know you and not just, I mean, you can work for a big brokerage, you know, nobody connects with, a name like Marsh or Aon, you know, they might know it, they know it's a giant brokerage in the world, but that's not who they're working with from day to day. People want someone that they can call who they know they're going to pick up the phone, who they can trust, because if you're not writing a, a policy the right way and a building burns down, you know, it's not worth the paper that it's written on, right? If you have no coverage, they want to know that you're doing what's in their best interest and you're going to take care of them at the end of the day. And it's so much easier to do that when they feel like they know you and not just the corporate brand that's behind you. Although I do think it's becoming more and more interesting to see how there's interplay between personal brands and corporate brands in today's world and how do yeah. we find ways to make those work and work together. And you know, one thing I heard that was really interesting in a conversation was this idea of adopting personal brands and corporate brands like professional athletes do with their teams, where a lot of times in corporate America, and especially in an industry like insurance, that's you know a little bit slower to adopt these things. You'll see kind of some friction between once people start growing a personal brand. A lot of times their company starts pushing back, and we don't know how that's going to reflect on our brand. And maybe at a certain point, it's better to just go our separate ways because we don't want this impacting us. Even if it's bringing in more sales, which is crazy to me, especially as a salesperson, I'm like, if it's bringing in revenue by this person sharing on the internet, I mean, what could be better than that, right? As long as they're not doing anything crazy, you know, that's reflecting poorly on the brand. But what professional athletes do is they can have their own personal brand and be associated with the team brand as well. And I think the more we can incorporate that kind of attitude into corporate America, the better off we'll be. Yeah. And and you talked about that in some of your social media posts. I remember months back um, when you were in the corporate world, we'll, we'll get into what you're doing now shortly, but you talked about that. And, and, you know, I work, I do predominantly a lot of work in marketing now. And I tell folks like, it does not make any sense for all of your employees to just on social media, just focus on the corporation because at sooner or later, someone's going to knock on a door and that person has to have some kind of brand, right? right? Like if you knock on the door, it's like, hi, I'm from Marsh. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't know you. They don't, they can't tell if they can trust you. So it's like, it's incumbent on the, these organizations to say the, the person, the producer, the underwriter, they need a brand too. And the best ones I've seen are the ones that allow those folks to have a personality. I know it's a fine line, right? And like you said, with teams and sports, with athletes and teams, there's a fine line. People do cross that line, but I think you've navigated that particularly well. If you were going to give advice to a young person, you know, let's say uh, we're going back 15 years to a young Skylar, you're still young, but a younger Skylar, um, mm-hmm. And, and you were going to start and you had these tools available. How would you advise them to start? 
Yeah. So I think, you know, you could make an argument both ways on this. For me, it was the kind of thing where it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Because I think if you go to your company and say, what am I allowed to post? Am I allowed to post X, Y, Z? It's going to turn into don't do anything. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because yeah. the yeah. easiest thing to say is just no. Yeah. I think using good judgment is critical, right? Especially if you're talking about your company or your clients. I mean, discretion with my clients is my number one thing. So even if I post like a story or a case study, you know, I'm usually changing some details so that especially if it's a client that I have an NDA with, or I know that they value privacy. I mean, I'm never going to post my clients' names in my posts for a case study or anything, but yeah. I might change the numbers or, you know, instead of saying they own in this state, I'm going to say they own in this state so that they're more difficult to identify, you know, so using good judgment, using good discretion, if you're ever going to share personal details about anyone else, whether it be a client, you know, third party representative, someone within your company, ask them first, see what they're comfortable with, right? And don't get involved in crazy things. I mean, you can post, someone told me, you know, 70% value, 30% viral, which is roughly kind of what I try to stick to. And what that means is post about insurance and insurance related topics or real estate related topics 70% of the time stick to your value. And then 30% of the time you can post about more personal things or share things that you just think people will like. Maybe it's a picture of your dog, but you never want to get into arguing about politics, for example, which is a mm -hmm. big one these days, right? You don't want to cross certain lines, especially early in your career where you haven't proven your value to the firm yet. You don't want to be on LinkedIn, you know, arguing about Trump versus Biden. That's not the first impression you want anyone to have of you. Um, focus on kind of building your skill set first and building your value both for yourself and for your firm. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are kind of some rough guidelines that I try to say. And then everybody has a different threshold for what they're comfortable sharing about themselves. Right. I mean, one thing about me is like people, I think I share enough that a lot of people really feel like they know me. I never share really anything about my personal life or my family. I try to keep that off as much as possible. I mean, I might say little things, you know, my daughter's won their soccer championship, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's very surface level, but I'm not sharing anything private that's going on at home. That's way beyond my comfort level. For me, it's not appropriate. And I don't want to share that. I think some things are sacred. And for me, you know, my family, my home life is one of them. But other people feel differently. Some people are videoing, you know, their families all the time. And hey, that can definitely make people feel closer to you. So, but I think spending some time up front before you start posting on social media, if you haven't done that in the past, is really important too. kind of deciding what you're comfortable with and what you're not. Because once you cross those certain thresholds, that starts to become what people expect from you. And it's almost impossible to go back, right? So be really clear on what your personal brand is, what you want to put out into the world and kind of follow those guidelines. And if you're not sure, always wait. And I say this for emails too, for phone calls, for posts, you know, if it's something where you're kind of going, Oh, I don't know if this is going to wait 24 hours yeah. or 48 yeah. hours, give yourself a timeline. And it's not two hours where you may still be in the same mindset or the same feeling that you're feeling now, right? Hey, if 48 hours, I still feel like I want to post this, then I'll post it, you know, after I've had some time to think about it and is it appropriate or not? Versus just shooting from the hip and doing whatever you want to do. I think it's a lot easier to get in trouble that way or have someone else look at it. You know, I have several friends who all bounce ideas off of, especially because, you know, my sense of humor sometimes is a little funky. <laughs> and I would say in writing, you know, making jokes can even come across worse than if you're making them out loud sometimes. So I'll have certain friends who all go, hey, you know, if you read this on LinkedIn or on Twitter, how would you read it? Or what would it come across as to you? you know, where everyone's going to read things differently. And so sometimes it just helps to have those different viewpoints. I think if you're new to your career too, and you have a group of folks in your office who are in a similar position and you all kind of want to get involved, just make it a pact that you'll bounce certain ideas off of each other, right? Have that support system built in so that you're not fumbling through trying to make all these decisions on your own. And you, if you don't know if your judgment's the best on a certain item, you have other people that you can lean on. That's critical too. Yeah. Would you describe your sense of humor as mid funny? Mid funny. That's it. Yeah. I'm never going to be super funny. I'm not the stand up girl, but always just mid funny. We keep it right there in that range. I had never heard of that term. So when I, I, I almost feel as though you coined it. You know, I think someone, I can't take credit for that. Someone referred to me as that on Twitter and I stole it and, and ran with it from there. The, the, those, yeah. those are the best ones. So yeah. it, it, I think with, TM trademark and now you own it. So, um, yeah. anyone, anyone that's trying to commercialize mid funny, you have to pr provide a licensing fee. <laughs> uh, so a couple more questions. One is how much 
did your daughters inspire you to write this book as well? Like how much was it like, I want a better world for them and, and I don't want them to go through what I went through? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I will say this. I have i don't want to portray myself as a victim. Like, oh, I went through all these horrible things in my career. I definitely have some moments along the way that shouldn't have happened. And I hope they don't happen for the next generation of women, right? But I would say overall, I've been extremely blessed in my career and had a ton more opportunities and allies and worked with great people versus, you know, having major hardships because I was a woman. Again, there were a few. But yeah, I mean, of course, I like to think every decision I make is, you know, revolves around my daughters in some way, but being a mom of twin girls really makes you look at the world in a different light, right? And it was one thing to build my own career and want to do this for myself. I think once you're a parent, you start thinking about things differently where it's not just about you. You really want to make sure that you're making a difference so that future generations can have it easier than you did. And, you know, like we talked about, it's definitely gotten better for women over the last couple decades, but there's still room to grow. And so, hmm. of course, First, I would love to see, you know, my my girls are 10 now. By the time they're looking at really building their career, I would love for them to not even have to think about like, hey, I'm a woman and I want this role. Just, hey, I'm a person and I want this role, right? That that would be perfect for me. So the more we can work towards that end goal, I think the better position we're in. Maybe when they're mature enough, they can get a job at ATW Advisors. <laughs> Maybe. Well, so. Okay, so let's already, finish this. Working for me a little over the summer. They're helping oh, nice, with nice, nice, yeah. very nice. So, so why don't we end talking about your? Not only are you an author, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, recently left my 17 year brokerage career to launch my own firm, and it's an owner's insurance rep firm. So a little bit different, essentially insurance consultancy, right? But we really like to get more involved into our client's core business. And we focus on the industries that I'm really good at, which are commercial real estate and development. Yep. Um, eventually, we may branch out into more, you know, just to help business owners across the board. But for right now, we're the, what we're best at. So what does ATW stand for? ATW stands for all the way. So the that way. kind of represents both my leap from broker role to entrepreneurship and also just the way we work with our clients, you know, we want to be with you all the way. Yep. And, um, and from what I've seen and what you've described about it in a couple of the other podcasts I've seen you on, um, you, you have, you're structuring this not as a traditional brokerage, right? So this is you, you're looking to have a deeper relationship with your clients and, and solve deeper problems. I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, we, it's not a brokerage at all, right? We're not placing any coverage. We're kind of a bridge between the client and their broker. I think what's different from our perspective is, you know, one, we don't have any third party relationships to consider, right? In my broker role, I started realizing as one will, once, once you get deep enough into it, you know, you want to do what's best for the client, but you also have to put a certain amount of volume with each carrier. You also have to keep your underwriters fed and happy, right? Yeah. You also have to yeah. keep your wholesalers fed and happy. You also have to run your TPA relationships and your, your COI relationships. And there are all these different people to balance. And that's one of the toughest things as a broker. And I'm not putting that down as a role. I mean, even the best brokers have to manage all these things. With ATW, a lot of that pressure is taken off because the only person I need to think about is the client and what's best for them. I don't have all the third parties to, to worry about at all. And what we try to do is really get involved more in their core business to the point where, again, having been a broker, I know how critical this is where the data you get from the client is what you have. And you can put together your best submission to underwriting based on the data you receive. But a lot of clients either historically, especially in the software market, right, didn't want to dedicate a lot of resources to insurance, may not have a dedicated insurance procurement risk management. As the market hardens and it's becoming more of a conversation, I think people are have more eyes on it and want to make it more of a priority. And sometimes they just don't know how. They feel like the insurance industry is opaque. They don't know where to turn yep. to ask questions. They know that everybody has different incentive structures and they don't know where to look and they don't have the expertise themselves. They don't know who to ask. And that's really how APW was born. We just want to be a resource for you and do it in your best interest. Help the broker get the best information for its submission. Help identify gaps where maybe there's an access point that we haven't gotten to or a certain carrier that the broker can't go to. Um, you know, it's it's. Each case is different, but we're really just there to help the client in their insurance and risk management function. And the ultimate goal is because I think with the soft market, so many poor insurance procurement habits were built up at various companies. 
And people are, when they're buying insurance, they are reactive buyers. And so my ultimate goal with every client at ATW, and it takes a good year or two to get to this point, right? With a client just getting into their business enough where we're no longer looking at insurance as a reactive purchase. We're now playing offense and we're going out and we're taking control of the process, right? And insurance procurement is now very intentional and we're, we have steps lined up and we have operations in place and we have procedures. And that's really the place that we want to get to with each client. Some are more open to that than others, right? So it's a process and everybody's different, but. I mean, I, I love that approach. And, and for, you know, everyone that's listening to this, I like really highly recommend that you connect with Skylar and follow her either on Twitter or on LinkedIn. You'll get an education. But I think more importantly, um, there's that has been my experience dealing with brokerage is that there's, I'll call it a lack of innovation, right? Because of what it is that they're trying to do, that it's it's prevented things like parametric insurance, it's prevented things like getting, you know, sometimes a captive insurer, a captive structure is ideal, right? And, and, and I agree with you. I think in the soft market, a lot of really bad decisions were made and, and companies that should have been prepared for a hard market were not. And now- okay. Now they're facing the consequences of that. Yep, that's right. I mean, they're just, it was a budget line item, right? And when it was going down five or 10% every year, nobody really cared about it, right? It was one of your operational expenses. You got to pay it, it's insurance, whatever, on to the next thing. We're budgeting for it, we're passing it down to our investors, whatever the case may be, but we're not worrying about it. And now they're realizing, oh, I just got a hundred percent insurance increase. Now it's all hands on deck and we really want to think about insurance and what can we do to be proactive. Right. And so I think ATW was born from that time in the market and just the need for that role. So we're here to help people. Yeah. Awesome. So the book is, so she did. Um, I will put links to Skylar's connections. I will put links to, is it available outside of Amazon or is it just on Amazon? You know, there's a website. It's like so she did book.com, but the easiest thing to do is just go to Amazon and buy okay. it there. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will put links to all of those in the show notes. And I'm I'm ecstatic to share you with the rest of the world, share your book with the rest of the world as well. The world would be better off if more people were connected with you. So thank you so much for coming on board. Thanks for having me, Nick. <laughs>